Good morning, everyone. John Rosengard with Environmental Risk Communications in Oakland, California. Thank you for joining our webinar today on auditors' tough questions on environmental liabilities. The outline for our talk today is uh, a little bit of background on me and our topic. I'll give you a one-page elevator speech on, um, on auditors' tough questions. From there, I'll cover uh, GAP key references briefly and then get into the core of our content here today, which is the tough questions themselves. They're grouped by uh, portfolio level questions, site-specific level questions, financial uh, uh, auditing questions, and so on. Uh, finally, I'll close with some examples of audit defense metrics, which in their preparation will help provide uh, an audit defense or at least a, a basis for a dialogue with an auditor about the performance of, a, uh, uh, of an environmental liability management program. And uh, from there, we'll take, uh, we'll take Q&A. Uh, thanks again for, uh, for joining us. Uh, before I get started with my bio, I just wanted to bring up a, a coupon, sorry, a cartoon that uh, Greg Rogers uh, Shared with me uh, a few years back. I think it's a New Yorker, uh, you know, a New Yorker uh, cartoon to give proper credit about that three billion dollars. Environmental liability sometimes seems like that it's, that it's a, a long-term nebulous um, uh, challenge to be worked down, and that that uh, auditing that can mean sometimes uh, reaching into the furthest recesses of your memory and mind about uh, where those numbers came from and uh, where they're going in the future. So a little bit of background about me. I started a company called Environmental Risk Communications, Inc. in February of 1994. Um, I'm the author of a software tool called Defender, uh, which has been used or is being used for uh, uh, forecasting around 4,400 individual distinct liabilities. I've also, um, as part of outreach and sharing uh, some work on ASTM standards, given over 100 speeches and webinars on topics related to environmental liability management and quantification. Those are specifically listed there, AROs, remediation, due diligence, and so on. I'm also the ASTM technical contact. This is a volunteer activity, so uh, please be patient with me. But uh, the technical contact for two standards, uh, one on disclosure of environmental liabilities, my term runs until 2021, and 3123, which is recognition and derecognition of environmental liabilities, my term there runs until 2022. By way of educational background, and by the way, my full bio is in my LinkedIn profile. I've got an MBA from Northwestern and a bachelor's in business from Georgetown. So I'm not an attorney. I'm not a CPA. I am not an environmental, mechanical, civil um, uh, engineer. And uh, I hope that my perspective, nonetheless, as a management consultant and software developer, is useful, interesting, and uh, uh, thought-provoking for today's topic for you uh, as you go forward in your work. Now, let's move to the short version of today's presentation. Um, outside audit is a vital step in confirming that historical and predictive or forecasted data is reliable. So those numbers are, are important and relevant and they need to be checked uh, by independent neutral observers. Auditors are out there seeking to uncover biases, cognitive biases that can distort uh, what are the true risks that an organization faces, how those risks turn into liabilities that have to get booked and ultimately discharged over time. And then finally, how those liabilities are ultimately settled via work or via payment or a mix of both. With that in mind, uh, 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 please remember that auditors are on a search. They're on a search for uh, contradictory evidence. And, and normally they don't find it, but they're on a search for contradictory evidence as a check on the valuations and on the people closest to the liabilities. So they're asking tough questions about the neutrality, objectivity, um, the rigor uh, that, that's been applied in looking at environmental liabilities. So they're, what's fair game is asking questions like, is the fair value, the market value of today, of, the, of a given environmental liability really zero or is it just the budget that's zero? So again, enforcing vocabulary, consistent use of vocabulary uh, accurately is, uh, is part of their work. Uh, second, is this liability zero only because there's currently non-enforcement of existing laws and regulations? Um, GAP is very specific about saying, even though uh, laws and regulations are not being fully enforced, that uh, that, that has an impact, but it's it's not a uh, an effect of zeroing out a liability because of a given law or reg is not being enforced. Um, third, uh, do you hope or think or know that your field data is showing zero liability? So I, I guess a, a sense of 
of, of converting scientific insights into a, a gut feel or a perspective that's that's useful from a financial perspective? Do you hope? Do you have a just a, a suspicion? Do you think? Do you have a rational basis of comparison? Or do you know? Have you verified? Have you validated? Have you tested the very idea that the liability uh, is, is going to be zero indefinitely? Uh, next point, uh, if we sold an asset tomorrow, will the liability discount being taken by the buyer truly be zero? Can, you, can anyone and everyone expect that outcome? And then finally, we bought this asset six months ago. We've had time to do our purchase accounting and due diligence work. Is the liability still zero? Now, we know we bought it thinking the liability was zero, but we've had time to look at the site more closely, maybe conduct a phase one or phase two environmental assessment. Is it still zero uh, or, or, uh, or not? With that in mind, a, a couple of uh, uh, highlights about how generally accepted accounting principles, which is, is what auditors work off of, have been evolving over the last uh, 45 years or so. Um, federal laws really were just came on the scene in the early 70s, and general accepted accounting principles sort of lagged a little bit. Um, FASB 5, the, the, the accounting for contingency statement from FASB, uh, came out in 1975. It wasn't until 1996 that the American Institute of CPAs came up with a document called Statement Position 96-1. So SOP 96-1. Uh, was the next major waypoint 21 years later about booking and, and reserving for and discharging environmental liabilities and how to measure them going into a reserve. From there, it was a few more years before um, FASB issued statement number 143, asset retirement obligations, which was the result of, um, of a seven-year-long effort of drafting uh, a, a uh, accounting rules around a new type of environmental liability called asset retirement obligations that didn't exist before 2001. Uh, that rule just came in effect again in 2001 and was refined three years later through something called FIN 47. Since then, other standard setting organizations um, like the International Accounting Standards Board and GASB, the Government Accounting Standards Board, um, have also been actively catching up or, or aligning the uh, definitions of things like uh, asset retirement obligations, remediation liabilities, commitments, contingencies, uh, guarantees, um, uh, asset at retirement obligations, decommissioning liabilities, and so on. There's just been a general alignment uh, of those parts of GAAP. But from where we are today, there, there have never been more general accepted accounting principles relevant to environmental liabilities. The, the, uh, the number and depth of those, uh, those principles it's never been more thorough and complex. So I just want to point out that it's been a, a moving and evolving uh, evolving set of principles over time. And you can expect that, I think, going forward, as again, we, we all learn more about what takes an environmental liability um, from inception, from starting out as a risk, turning it into a, a, an early stage verifiable liability, all the way through the end to, to where the liability is fully discharged and settled in, in due course. One of the takeaways from looking at general accepted accounting principles today versus in 1975 is there are five types of environmental liabilities scripted out in general accepted accounting principles. Um, I've got them listed left or right in numerical order uh, according to how GASB defines them, uh, but I just want to give you a sense that, that uh, one of the things that an auditor is looking for is proper application of the silos, that there isn't uh, double counting of putting a liability in the, the financial assurance or guarantee side of things, as well as the remediation liability side of things. The proper number of times to count a liability is once, uh, not zero times, not two times. That's it for the, uh, the sayings for the day. If you want uh, more detail on this, I've got a separate webinar uh, up on our YouTube page about uh, how to identify and estimate individual liabilities. So I won't be covering that, uh, that content again here today. So let me talk a little bit about auditors who are there to perform a periodic test uh, uh, on the accuracy and reliability of liability forecasts. And then the liability managers themselves who may be project managers, portfolio managers, uh, vice presidents um, uh, of corporations and so on. Where auditors are there to add value is they're, they're there to prevent and or correct errors in financial statements, detect and prevent fraud, 
malfeasance, other uh, criminal activity, they're to determine merit, materiality and the cost benefit of any further investigation to understand where a liability is, is headed and how it's uh, documented. To test the design and effectiveness of internal controls, which is a, a very clear term to accountants, but for, uh, for, for lay use, this means ensuring that, that uh, risks are understood to be risks, liabilities are booked as liabilities, and then spending to reduce those liabilities go directly against those reserve accounts for those individual liabilities. Finally, uh, auditors add value through confirming that similar liabilities get documented in similar ways, that there isn't a, a reinventing of the wheel uh, over time and across each individual liability. So they're there to, to improve efficiency. Where managers add value, just as a contrast, uh, managers set the tone at the top about transparency, reliability, and integrity of estimates. Uh, they're there to look at uh, uh, corporate values and how they're expressed through spending, through budgets and capital plans. Uh, they're there for compliance assurance to make sure that uh, what, what uh, are set out as the rules of the game inside of a company are followed closely and that uh, gradually hoping that a, uh, an assessment of a risk is correct is replaced by thinking, good solid thinking, and then by testing and validation, in other words, by knowing uh, uh, a liability will behave in a given fashion over time. Other ways that managers add value include uh, uh, providing the proper people, training, tools, and procedures, and ensuring that uh, similar liabilities get discharged or settled in similar ways. Just as a contrast in duties, things that a manager does but an auditor doesn't do, uh, order a phase two environmental assessment. That is not the responsibility of an auditor. Uh, an auditor can express interest in having more data at the next go around, next quarter, next year, um, when, reserve, when reviewing a reserve, but an auditor is not there to say, the only way I'll sign off on this number is, is, uh, is, is to have my, my guys come in and do a phase two assessment. That just doesn't happen. Uh, other things that a manager can do include determining the pace to closure, how quickly a liability portfolio is going to be settled or discharged over time. Whether that's two years or 200 years, an auditor's not there to set that tone. A liability manager is there to set that tone as part of an expression of how an organization wants to, uh, to be perceived and what its values are. Uh, third point, uh, an, uh, a liability manager is there to select a remedial technology, and decide if an employee acted improperly, those are not duties of auditors. Um, another, other areas are, include uh, ensuring that there's enough data to split an environmental risk or environmental compliance costs between operating expenses, capital expenditures, asset retirement obligations, and reserve dollars. Uh, in another uh, webinar, I go over the five types of money that are available for, uh, for discharging environmental liabilities. I won't cover that in detail here, but um, again, I, what I want to underscore is just this last point. Uh, a liability manager is there to defend and explain the budget if needed, but an auditor isn't there to set and define what the annual budget ought to be. So the conceptual framework that, uh, that auditors work from provides some useful vocabulary points. Uh, the vocabulary points that I'm going to pull out is from the, site, the source you see at the bottom of the slide, uh, financial accounting uh, concepts statement number eight from September of 2010. Actually quite a bit older than that, but that's the last uh, uh, minor update of this document. But that document is all in words. I converted it into this graphic. So this graphic is, uh, is mine, but it's, uh, it's got some, uh, 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 well, it, it just matches identically what's in statement number eight. So the objective of financial reporting, the, the documents that an auditor will start with that, that uh, shows what investors and, and other stakeholders are relying on, are, are data that's useful to decisions. And those decisions are normally capital allocation, pace to closure, accuracy of environmental liabilities, following a, a, an acquisition or divestiture. Um, so useful to decisions is just, just the starting point. The next part that, that auditors look for is the data being presented relevant and a faithful representation. So let me just go over those two. We're looking for data that's relevant <clears throat> in terms of being predictive about the future, or confirmatory about the past, or both. So that's the relevant data. The next part, which is a real tough one, um, faithful representation means that the data being presented and used is complete and neutral and free from error. 
So those are the three go-bys that an auditor is looking for. And if, uh, again, an auditor suspects the data is incomplete, that it's got a cognitive bias of some kind, or that it's uh, it's just got, got bad math, <laughs> that, that in turn an auditor is there to add value by correcting for these three qualitative characteristics, complete and neutral and free from error. The ways that auditors get there include uh, the next um, portion of the slide moving off to the right, uh, comparability, verifiability, timeliness of data, and understandability. Timeliness, for example, means that an estimate is from the last six to 18 months, not from four to 10 years ago. Uh, and, and so a simple question that an auditor can ask can be, when's the last time someone looked at and updated this estimate for today's unit prices? And if the answer again is, is no one's looked at that one for four to 10 years. Uh, that's something that, that, again, if it's material, if it's significant, they can say that's, that's a weakness. It might not be a large weakness or a significant weakness, but it, it can be systematic of something else that they want to dig for across the rest of the portfolio. Uh, in terms of uh, the elements of financial statements, keep in mind that what's used internally in a company for recognizing and measuring a liability are just the fundamental starting points. So a lot of the auditing can be around the recognition and measurement processes that are in place. The recognition is, is it or isn't it an environmental liability? Measurement, what is the right number and what are the range of numbers behind that number being used in a reserve or a watch list or some other documentation? The, the last two, presentation for internal use, disclosure for external use normally, uh, those are, are, are really just uh, compilations of the data that go through the the initial meat grinders of the recognition and measurement processes first. Everything is, sub is uh, subject to the notes at the bottom. A cost constraint, uh, you can't spend a million dollars to look at a million dollar liability, so you have to be reasonable about the level of effort uh, that you apply to looking at an individual liability and an entire portfolio. And then materiality, you can't uh, be auditing for uh, $500 line items and $200 line items when there are $200,000 and $500,000 individual liabilities that have just come into the portfolio that may need, uh, uh, that deserve further scrutiny. So with that in mind, let me go into the risks uh, uh, covered on the previous slide that are understood by experienced auditors. First of all, for a faithful representation where it's complete, neutral, and free from error, an auditor is going to understand that there's a, la a lag between a legislative or regulatory change and reserves and, and uh, associated watch lists getting updated accordingly. Um, they're also aware that there are risks of material restatements of environmental liabilities that may have happened in the past and could, could reoccur in the future. This is uh, often a battle between having enough data and having that data move through the value chain from a vendor to a project manager to a portfolio manager to get quantified and then get into a reserve. Uh, experienced auditors will know that there's a periodically a lack of data or a lack of conclusive data, uh, or that there are unqualified estimators buried in the process, or a, a systematically maybe a mischaracterization of a, of, a, of a site or a liability as being early stage when it truly is a late stage, and the consent decree is adequate evidence that a liability is, is, uh, is truly at a late stage from a regulator's perspective. Uh, other things that a, 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 an auditor looks for are, um, of course, the criminal activity, the personally negligent activity of uh, malfeasance, uh, fraud, uh, uh, negligence, and so on. Other things that, uh, other risks that are well understood by experienced auditors are that there's a systemic loss of institutional knowledge over time, and that there uh, periodically appears to be, and in some organizations there truly is, uh, deliberate understaffing, that there isn't a uh, the capital or the, uh, the headcount, we're having an infinite number of people to work on an infinite number of environmental liability management projects to, to settle them infinitely quickly. No organization, no arm of the federal government or the state government has the capital and the people to carry out every cleanup and get them all done in one year. No one's ever broken the bad news to you. Uh, let it be me. Uh, but it, the only way that, that uh, environmental liabilities occurred is gradually over time, different spills, different releases, different uh, uh, waste management practices were in place over different decades. The only way they'll get settled and resolved is sort of on the same sort of time scale. They took 
20 to 100 years or more to occur. In some cases with treaty groundwater, they'll take 20 to 100 years to resolve. And even then the, the results might not be fully satisfactory to everybody. So again, keep in mind an experienced auditor is going to know that, that, uh, that there's a, a loss of knowledge, that there's a need for an infinite number of people, and that forgetting things is what organizations get to be really good at. Employee turnover is just murder on having uh, a, good, a good understanding of what yesterday's strategy was, what tomorrow's will be, and where that will all go. And finally, uh, one thing that experienced auditors look for and that they have a special name for is unstructured judgment. If you work in environmental liability management, your consultants may call them swags or heaving numbers over the transom, or uh, I don't know what you're going to do with this number, but here's my guess. That's called in accounting terminology unstructured judgment, where there's, where there's a lack of benchmark data, a lack of rigor in looking at alternatives, a lack of a former, formal DA or decision analysis process, and a lack of compliance assurance or organizational excellence uh, about a uh, following the procedures that are in place and then personally signing off that those uh, those procedures were followed. So again, keep in mind, experienced auditors know what they're looking for and looking at. They may not be fully experienced at, at knowing every environmental issue that may pop up, but I just want to point out that experienced auditors will know how to find these issues in, in other types of liabilities like uh, pensions or product warranty costs or accounts payable. They'll know how to detect uh, and prevent fraud, and they're applying that professional expertise to ask good questions that add value to everybody and make the organization stronger over time. So with that in mind, I just want to share with you the, uh, the idea of a bullseye that an auditor uh, can be using when they're looking at environmental liabilities. Clearly, everyone will know what a budget is. That's the spending program for the year in progress, maybe, maybe the next year coming up, but no further. The next circle out in that bullseye is what the current book to reserve is. And outside of that, that red circle is what isn't booked, but might be reservable in the foreseeable future. And those are the two outer circles. I characterize them as, a, as you see on the far right side of the screen, the book to market gap. So if your organization was merged with another, what would the liability value for, for all activities, for all risks, be priced at today, it wouldn't be necessarily the reserve dollar for dollar as it is today. It may include a premium or discount for other factors like emerging contaminants, um, phases of investigation that haven't been completed yet, or the long-term O&M that goes past, say, year 10, year 30, year 60, and goes off into uh, to approach 100 years or more. Those are, are the outer circles, the, uh, the pre-recognition watch list, those liabilities that haven't been put on the reserve yet, and the post-settlement uh, watch list, which you may know by a better term called reopeners. Uh, so again, those four circles constitute what, uh, what an auditor is aware of. If they're auditing a transaction, a fair market value transaction, they can look at all four. But if they're just looking year after year at the reserve balance that's set, they're just looking at the inner two, which is again, just the budgets and the current reserve or for, um, uh, for International Accounting Standards Board companies, uh, provisions, uh, and, and they're just looking at, again, uh, uh, the accuracy of those numbers over time. So with that, let's get into the heart of our presentation here today. I've got these bunched into portfolio questions and three busy slides, and then site-specific, and then three busy slides, and so on. So I, I, what I'm going to do is, is really just read these and, and provide some annotation, to about the citations that are off on the right-hand uh, side of the slide. Uh, slide here today. So first question area can be our project teams and key external consultants that provide estimates, are they qualified to do that? Um, it, it's a, just a common question now about the credentials of the experts that are signing off on the estimates. It doesn't mean that, that uh, uh, the expert that, that uh, verifies or validates that the estimate is correct is the sole person involved in producing that estimate. But instead, uh, an auditor can just ask a simple question of, what is your bio? How many sites have you evaluated? Is this your, your first as an apprentice? Or is this your, your 500th as a, uh, as a principal at an environmental liability management uh, contractor? Uh, next up, are estimate preparation standards and expectations clear? And those can be things like the PCAOB 
uh, standards that I've got listed here, as well as the ASTM standards uh, 2137 is the estimating standards standard for uh, environmental liabilities, just by reference, uh, and, and understanding if there are qualifications and certifications and training in place that they've been consistently followed. That's again a common a common area. The next question set: What are the risk factors which can cause environmental liabilities to really grow quickly? Uh, and just as a baseline, to three times their current level, uh, which anyone would agree is a significant uh, departure from current expectations. How likely are these risk, risk factors to occur in the next 10 years? In other words, are emerging contaminants uh, going to be a material risk? That's the answer that they're after. Uh, and then are factors and likelihoods benchmarked with peers regularly? Or in other words, is there just a, a unstructured judgment or is there some structure uh, to the judgment? The third uh, question area is the same work breakdown structure used for all sites and all cost forecasts, or is there a one-off approach to, to individual sites where they're not quite automatically mergeable, mechanically combinable? Uh, that's, again, something that, uh, that ours look for. Next, are, audit, are all estimates reviewed recently? The standard of care, every three to 12 months. Uh, uh, and are they adjusted to current unit costs like the current price of diesel and concrete and backfill and um, uh, trucking and landfill space and environmental engineering expertise, legal expertise? Are there current unit prices? And if not, why not? And then for the numbers that are summed to give a grand total, do those numbers actually add up? And then finally on this page, for discounting liabilities to their present values, which is mandatory for asset retirement obligations, not mandatory for all the other types of environmental liabilities, is the discount rate and the method used uh, uh, visibly displayed. In other words, is there an Excel spreadsheet that can show where uh, dollar value X came from? One of the challenges of using Excel is even though there's a great formula in there, equals PV, parentheses, et cetera, if you use that formula all by itself straight out of the box, it, it will discount your year zero expenditure and every CPA will know, every auditor will know that discounting doesn't start until next year. And so the, the one of the gotcha areas can be if, uh, if a person new to looking at environmental liabilities discounts year zero, then an auditor comes in and adds value by correcting for that, that common year zero mistake. Uh, and finally, are settlement dates stated if they're assumptions or are they known if they're spelled out in a consent decree, administrative order on consent, or some other um, notice of violation or regulatory, uh, regulatory statement. Second area of, uh, of tough portfolio level questions, are there owned or leased properties where the company will intentionally, willfully not conduct a phase two assessment? Which by the way, is in everybody's right to say, I'm not gonna go looking for something, I've got other uses for this property, I'm not gonna conduct a phase two environmental assessment, uh, for whatever reasons I've got, but I'm not going to do that today. A banker that is, is checking on the value of collateral may differ. An auditor may differ. Um, a neighbor, a property neighbor may have differing findings that say you need to understand what might be coming from your property onto mine. But again, those are all hypotheticals. The, the hard and fast rule is an auditor can be there to ask if there's a conscious decision to not study a site any further and to ask why. And, uh, and see if that poses or, or, or uh, uh, again, develop a hypothetical about whether that poses a risk based on comparable sites, based on comparable situations. Next, are there any sites where the lack of enforcement is the reason for not studying, not remediating the site? Again, an auditor is there for, for understanding and, and explaining if there's a difference between the market value today, which can be based on, which can and is based on ambiguity, versus a desire to, to avoid unpleasant news or an interest in shooting the messenger, if you will. Um, again, the, these are challenges that any organization goes through. There's always a passion for more current data and just for more data to make sure that nobody is making any error of any kind. There's never enough data. But if there's a lack of enforcement that's being used as a basis for saying the environmental liability for, for this matter, for the soil and groundwater at this factory, or, or uh, in these sediments that uh, truly is zero, th that's, that's one of the things that, again, an auditor's there to check. The budget can be zero. That's fine to say we're not spending any money on this this year or next on to the next site. But the liability, 
again, the, the carrying value of the collateral, that's one of the things that an auditor is there to check. And if there's a sus suspicion that the collateral might be hurt by some, some ambiguity about environmental issues, then that's where, again, an auditor can say, we, we don't have solid information about site X. I wish we did because comparable sites Y and Z didn't turn out too well. And uh, we have to expect that any buyer or any lender that's curious about the value of our collateral is going to think the very same thing. Uh, third area, does your audit evidence treat liabilities as obligations instead of commitments, contingencies, or guarantees? And this is a going back to 1975 type of issue when every environmental liability automatically was a contingency. It was just a maybe it will, maybe it won't, maybe it'll get, get really bad. Uh, but it was those, if you can imagine, two legs or three legs of an event tree, and it, it didn't um, necessarily need much more thinking than that. In time, and, and July 2009 is one of those in time points, uh, environmental liabilities were recast as obligations are one thing, where you can have an asset retirement obligation. Obligation means there is a duty there, whether you book for it or you don't book for it, the duty is still there. You built this building, you have a duty to bring it down someday. Whether you book it or don't book it, that's on your conscience, but the, the, the duty is already there because you built it or because it's your property. Um, again, obligations as different from you're guaranteeing the performance of other entities through joint and several liability, or you're, you're performing under a commitment because you signed a lease to say you're going to return the lease property in the condition in which your company got this land uh, uh, many, many years ago. Uh, again, commitments, contingencies like litigation and guarantees are very, very different from the obligations that we had just in, in one of the earlier slides in today's talk. And that's, again, where an auditor can ask for uh, you know, who decided this was a liability. It can be one of those questions. Who set this obligation? Was it a federal government agency? Was it a state environmental agency? Who decided this was an obligation that had to be fulfilled? And then how is this obligation going to be satisfied or fulfilled? Or in other words, how is it going to be settled? So um, again, keeping the mindset clear that in 1975, there was no such thing as an obligation. And now it's, it's two of the five types and two of the highest dollar values types of, of reserved environmental liabilities out there are AROs and remediation obligations. Uh, that's, again, one of the areas that an auditor can really be checking for is are these definitions being applied? Uh, if you have a commitment that's just a lease agreement that's nothing to do with a state or federal regulator, that's one thing. But if there's an obligation from, a, again, a regulator that says you're responsible for X, for um, uh, metals in the groundwater underneath your factory that were discharged you know, and, and found in your X. Uh, great, that, that sets clarity, but again, it doesn't necessarily require the immediate correction of, of uh, reserve values. An auditor can just be there to make sure that the right silos are being applied across all sites. And again, you can have all five types of, uh, all five subtypes of environmental liabilities at a single property. You can have several AROs for several different buildings. You can have several different uh, commitments in place and remediation obligations from individual spills and so on. It isn't a matter of saying one for one, this site is or isn't an ARO or remediation obligation or so on. It can be identifying subcomponents uh, from there. Next point, is there a site by site breakdown of liability? This is mandatory. This is spelled out in ASC 410-30 and GASB 49, uh, uh, paragraph 71 specifically. Uh, because you can't have a, a pooled liability that says this is this is all sites west of the Mississippi, or these are all sites in Florida, or these are all the sites that have 1,4-dioxane. Can't do it. You have to have a site-by-site -site breakdown because that is a unit of measure along with quarters, financial quarters and financial years. Site-by-site -site breakdown is 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 mandatory. You can't commingle many sites into a single a single reserve account or a single statement of risk. Next, are overhead costs charged to an appropriate reserve and included in the forecast? This is more optional than mandatory, but it, it, it's something that has to be applied consistently. Either overhead is spread out among all sites and risks and liabilities, 
or it's spread out among none and just, just booked and accounted for separately. Uh, you can't have, a, again, a little bit of both or inconsistency in there. Uh, next point is our future cost recovery is deducted from the liability calculation and netted out. It's actually a giant no-no because uh, the assets of incoming recoveries have to be stated separately from the liability itself. The liability has one set of triggers and tests that an auditor can look for, and the income or cost recoveries, separate set of tests, separate set of recognition, uh, recognition values. Co-mingling them together and say the money goes in and out of all and one bank account or in and out of one reserve account, not good enough. The asset is different from the liability, and if there's anything that you can take away, it's that an auditor is looking for something as simple as co-mingling of funds, of assets and liabilities into the same uh, unit of measure, which is, again, a site-specific liability determination. Next, uh, is there a year-by-year -year cash flow forecast for each site? That's, again, something that's normally, uh, normally done somewhere and uh, uh, asking for and seeing that there is a 10-year or 20-year O&M forecast available uh, is, again, something an auditor's got every, every right to ask for. Next, is there a, a recent spending history for the whole portfolio, and how long will reserves or for AROs, the, uh, the obligation pool, how long will that last in years? What does that mean? When auditors are looking for a, a, an aggressive spend pattern or a, a, a very, very slow spend pattern, that will show that at the current spend rate, the reserves will last for only two years or over 200 years. They're looking for crazy outliers like anyone else would. What's normal today, if you take um, the reserve, the, the current spending against the reserves for a company from their 10K report, divided by their year-end reserve balance, you come up with a number of, of roughly five to seven X, five to seven times. That's normal. That a, that a company will have seven times their their current year spending as their reserve balance, just as a rule of thumb. And there's a little bit of variation. Uh, you know, there are some companies out there with as few as three years or as many as 30 or more. But I'm just saying that that again, if, if an auditor found two years of spend is in the reserve or 200 years of spend is in the reserve, they would just ask us a question about you know what what was happening with the spending for last year that that this 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 metric seems to be uh, indicating some nonconformance in some way or some unusual portfolio behavior. What's going on? Um, next uh, a question, when was the last adjustment to the aggregate portfolio value? The normal answer is is quarterly, sometimes for less volatile uh, reserves or environmental liabilities. It could be once a year, but the uh, uh, the frequency of internal reviews, you know, can often vary for just project status reports to every two weeks to 30 days to 90 days. Um, but the financial roll-up can be uh, uh, it, uh, roughly every quarter or every year or, or somewhere in between. But that's just, again, a basis of comparison to what other companies are doing. Next, our project manager workloads resulting in task saturation. In other words, does it take a long time for a project manager or a liability manager to turn around a request for data because, again, there's so many other moving pieces uh, involved. Uh, what that means is an auditor is looking for understaffing as an indicator of a, of a lack of a faithful representation where numbers are complete and neutral and free from error. So, again, if the staff is, is, is uh, challenged, that's one thing. But if they're over, overworked and unable to provide estimates that are complete and neutral and free from error, then the auditor's got to do what they've got to do, which is report that there appears to be a, a shortcoming in faithful representation. Next point, our forecasts merged automatically. Uh, so are the numbers free from error when they're summed up on a portfolio level? Are there any sites with a zero reserve where a fact pattern says it's not going to be zero in the marketplace today and it's not going to work out over the next 10 years to be zero? Um, that's, again, looking for a, a Affirmatory value. Um, next, uh, two points is a if a liability or a property is part of recent M&A activity, where the costs and strategies migrated to reflect the acquirer's policies and procedures. So that's again a purchase accounting conformance step in the first 12 months after a, a, trans a strategic transaction like that closes. And then finally, are all properties with controlled, recognized environmental conditions or CREX documented, even though they have zero booked today? Are they still identified as risk? 
With that, let's talk a little bit about risk concentration, uh, meaning that there's a, just a, a check on the part of the auditor, on the, by an auditor, uh, for uh, an over-accumulation of risks uh, uh, based on a few moving pieces or parts. First, uh, our counterparties identified, especially on liabilities where the life cycle cost to close exceeds 100K. Uh, so in other words, if a liability is split 50-50 with uh, uh, a Fortune 500 company and a mom and pop uh, subchapter S privately held corporation, uh, is that 50-50 split viable for the next two years? Well, most definitely, but over the next 20 or 200 years, either party might be gone way before uh, 200 years is up. Consequently, the counterparty question can come up about whether there's an, uh, an over-reliance on a single party shielding uh, your entity from, uh, from an environmental liability, doubling an allocation, for example. Next, does your entity know its own credit rating? And if that rating is below average, is there a fair value measurement discount because of your diminished ability to pay? And are those calculations regularly updated? Again, if you, you think about um, the automotive companies um, a little over 10 years ago, you know, Ford and General Motors and Chrysler were all in acute financial distress in the late uh, you know, the time period of 2005 to 2010. Ford made it through that process without filing for Chapter 11, but Chrysler and General Motors did. Uh, along the way toward uh, Chapter 11, uh, General Motors and Chrysler uh, had the capability, had the opportunity to mark down their environmental liabilities from X to half of X or a third of X, to mark down their environmental liabilities because their ability to pay was looking more and more doubtful. The idea here of this point is, is that an auditor can say, you know, sometimes bankruptcy takes five or 10 or 15 years to play out. Uh, both in the run-up to the event and then the discharging of, of all liabilities after that, um, or the reorganization process after that. In the process, there isn't just a single event where the liabilities go from X to a third of X. It doesn't happen in one afternoon. It's a gradual process, and recognizing that gradual process is better accounting than recognizing a cliff edge of, uh, of all of that occurring all at once, all the recognition occurring all at once. Uh, next, are counterparties preventing liabilities from reverting back to the company? Are the terms of those commitments and guarantees understood? Uh, and then finally, would default by any one counterparty increase the portfolio by 5% and has a recent counterparty default increase, increase the reserve or an ARO? Again, you're going after faithful representation and applying recent confirmatory experience to your, your, predictive, um, your, your predictive forecast of reserves going forward. Let's return now to uh, site-specific questions. I've got two pages on these. Uh, first, are estimates in, uh, independent of a stakeholder bias, like a key vendor or an operating business that, that uh, has some expectations about cash flow outcomes uh, instead of the performance against specific obligations? So again, are the estimates free from bias? Are the estimates based on industry standard metrics for bracketing and selecting expected value? Uh, in other words, uh, does an early stage uh, estimate have a plus or minus 50%, whereas a late stage O&M site has a plus or minus 5 to 10%. That's the, the narrowing of the funnel if you've seen those diagrams uh, elsewhere in my webinars and in EPA guidance and ASTM standards. Uh, that's ordinary to say there's a contingency plus or minus X for an early stage site, but half of X or a tenth of X for the late stage sites that are in O&M. Um, next, uh, is structured decision analysis used to affirm the issues and alternatives in place? Are there pro, pros and cons of alternative scenarios articulated? This is useful for sites over a million dollars, particularly over $5 million. It's not relevant to every single site, uh, but bracketing the costs, which implicitly means bracketing some, some strategic alternatives or decisions available to a company, is again part of uh, what an auditor can be asking about. Uh, the fourth question, for higher cost sites, what is the backup strategy? If, if everything's relying on a given technology or a given a cost sharing agreement or a given uh, a regulatory framework, what happens if that doesn't work in our favor? What's the backup? And are the estimates for that backup also peer reviewed or are they just uh, assuming starting over and, and, and repeating the same 
spending result, if not the actual outcome. Uh, fifth one is our inflation and discount rates assumptions, as explicitly stated, are those calculations correct? And then tying back to a previous point, finally, is the project contingency percentage appropriate to a stage of a project? In other words, is there a comparability of estimates between similar sites that are at similar stages? Second page of site-specific questions can be, is there a demand letter to pay a share of costs on a multi-party site? If so, can I see a copy? Uh, because again, that independent uh, uh, verification or statement of an obligation is, is where liabilities can be rooted in. And, and finding that and, and seeing that uh, uh, verification from an independent party uh, is uh, again, an important part of record collection and uh, documentation. Next, is the correct corporate entity holding on to environmental liabilities? And is that entity financially solvent? It is not unheard of for a Fortune 500 company in the United States today to have an outdated entity that's no longer a fully functioning business to be listed on an agreed order, uh, to be listed in a court order, to be listed in a judgment or a settlement. It's totally normal but where there may need to be supplementary documentation or an amendment to an agreed order with a state or federal regulator. It uh, can be if, if an entity is dissolved or renamed or just reincorporated in a different location for whatever the reason that the corporate formalities change. Managing the liability means that you, you have the correct corporate entity today in 2019 being pointed to in, in uh, documentation, even if it's indirect path to say amendment number one, New company uh, it guarantees the performance of original company X, which was formally dissolved in 2017. That's, that's again, a, a part of, of observing corporate formalities to make sure that there's a, a document trail for someone to look at 5, 10, 15 years down the road. And if you don't think it'll happen, call me. I'll give you some examples sometime. Uh, next bullet point, do guarantees and instruments of financial assurance reference any insolvent or non-operating companies on your side. Again, it's not unheard of, and no one's going to jail, but it's not something to be patient and satisfied with. It's something to eventually find the time for and fix, because it's an administrative technicality that, that doesn't make anybody look good, uh, whether it's on the regulator side or the corporate side. No one looks like they're doing their job if there's a reference to an outdated or dissolved or or unincorporated entity. Uh, and then finally, is, is a procurement uh, strategy in place and is procurement regularly competed out? And what's the duration of service for an incumbent vendor? This is one of the risks that a, um, a, an auditor will look for to find balance. It's okay to have a, a new vendor who's been on the job for a year and is still playing catch up, uh, but a year or two down the road, um, an auditor will expect higher quality answers for, for uh, as the, the vendor makes it up the learning curve. But where the, uh, on the other side that an auditor may see risk is if the same vendor is managing the same project for 15 years and the costs don't seem to be going anywhere up or down. There, don't seem, there doesn't seem to be any learning curve to become more efficient and there doesn't seem to be any expansion of the scope uh, based on finishing the work sooner or, or, or working everyone out of a job that much more efficiently. And that's, again, part of, of what an auditor is there to look for. Is there, is there evidence that the marketplace isn't quite working yet? And if so, what can be done about it? So with that in mind, let's move on to the tough questions about any probabilistic or fair value calculations, which are, again, a, a, a looking at the backup for the backup for the higher cost sites uh, that I mentioned previously. So first, is an entity's spending experience on finished projects applied to similar sites that are still just in the study or remedial design phases? Are any cost metrics like uh, disposal cost per ton of soil or cubic yard of soil, uh, sets per gallon for groundwater uh, extracted, treated, and discharged? Is that compiled and tracked? And is there a trend of continuous improvement showing that your organization is capable of doing more with less year after year, if not uh, month after month and quarter after quarter? It, it doesn't just help to keep the, uh, the vendors aware of what good performance look, looks like but also shows that, that there's a pass-through of, of information from the vendor through the corporate liability manager on to, uh, to the uh, external auditor. Uh, next up, uh, is remedy failure or strategy failure factored into the expected value of a site's forecast? Uh, unfortunately, not every technology will work successfully the first go-around. 
there will be uh, periodically a need to argue technical and practicability that after trying to pump out an aquifer, the, uh, the benchmark of three times, that contamination still exists and maybe some other processes are in place or need to be put in place to, uh, to satisfy the obligation. That's again something that an auditor can ask about because uh, again, if a, if a remedy has been going on as is where it is for 45 years, and there are some cleanups already approaching that, that benchmark um, of, of, of over 30 years, does it make sense to continue that work for another 30 years? Is that, is that the best way? And again, it's an innocent question of, do we have the best way? And if we do, great, on to the next one. And then finally, is non-performance risk of counterparty default, which is the five word accounting term for a, a PRP going broke, is that non-performance monitored and calculated on a systemic basis? Again, not for every single little PRP group that's got a 100K spend divided among 30 parties, not, not always practical, uh, but for where, again, there's a two-party site and it's your organization versus somebody else in a 50-50 split, fight to the death going out for, for 25 years, it'd be useful to, to not communicate a surprise in, in year X, but instead in, include a gradual deterioration of credit and react to that gradual deterioration of credit on the part of your counterparty before it's too late, before you're submitting a claim in bankruptcy. So a little bit about the, uh, the previous slide, um, I, I pulled in the capital stewardship expectations table from ASTM 2137, which is the, the estimation standard guide for environmental liabilities. Uh, so if you have a, a, a site that looks like it'll cost under 100K to close, uh, a detailed estimate and cost bracketing is probably all that's needed in terms of a audit, an audit trail. Uh, but more detailed audit trails uh, is useful as you go up on the cost scale. And so a million dollar site will probably benefit from having almost all of the, uh, the estimate uh, uh, and capital stewardship items that I've got displayed here. And certainly if a site is expected to cost over $5 million in the fullness of time, not based on current reserve, but the fullness of time, uh, then more cost engineering is indicated. Uh, in other words, if you have a million dollar site, you have one of the more unusual cleanup liabilities and can expect to, uh, to need to perform some of these non-field investigation and remediation steps to verify, validate that the environmental reserves and the capital stewardship planning is uh, in place and of uh, sufficient quality. An example of what, what good uh, logic and math can look like is displayed from this example from a uh, same ASTM standard 2137, where you're looking at uh, an individual site media starting on the far left, like soil or groundwater or sediments. And then you're looking at uncertainties, the random things that can happen to you that you can't control. The next column over are negotiations, which are things like the cleanup levels that you determine with your regulators and to some extent maybe uh, other stakeholders. And then finally, you get into the decisions. What an auditor can look for are the siloing of those three things. If you mix those three things up, which happens for, for new users of event trees, uh, they'll have to correct for it. They'll look for it, they'll, they'll see it from a mile away, and they'll correct for it. Because again, it's a, a, a common error to blur decisions with random uncertainties, with random uh, negotiations. But the formal structure is to put what you can't control versus what you sort of control versus what you fully control far apart from each other and don't blur those lines. Uh, this is a very, very simplified example. And sometimes all that's left are just the random uncertainties out there. Whatever is, informs the basis of your budgeting and your reserving and your liability forecasting, what an auditor likes to see is that there's rigor, consistency, and thought, and where there are numbers that come into play, that experience is brought in from comparable sites, not just one data point, but a low mid high of those, uh, those range of data points. So again, it looks simple, and for the first time out, it's a bear to, to finish, uh, but uh, I assert to you that if you've done five of these, they start to all look alike, because these uh, event trees do have a very steep learning curve, and again, uh, consistency is what everyone's after, and achieving that consistency is actually a pretty reasonable near-term result, near-term expectation everyone can have. Well, finally, let's move on to recoveries. The tough questions about recoveries are, are, are naturally, you know, are they booked separately? But let's get into some more detail here. Is there an insurance carrier currently funding a company's defense? In other words, the study costs for looking at an environmental liability. And if so, what are the coverage limits? When will those limits be reached? 
and therefore when will the, the spending go from 50-50 us and an insurer to 99-1 where we're spending almost all of the money and not getting any recoveries. So the things that, a, that an auditor can ask about are, is there a time limit or a statute of limitations on this recovery? Is there a tolling agreement that, is, that suspends the statute of limitations in place? Is there a coverage sailing scope limitations like is it just going to cover, are they just going to reimburse study and monitoring costs or will they cover soil and groundwater removal and cleanup costs? And if there's you know, co-pay or co-insurance like you see with your personal medical insurance, you know, is there a co-pay where, where that math needs to be factored into the ultimate calculation of what's recoverable versus what ultimately might be recovered? Uh, next, does an entity serve as a banker or a contracting agent for an unincorporated association? And this is these next two questions you get into like an iffy contracting area where you know your entity for convenience sake may say you know this is a this is going to be an expensive cleanup it's going to go for a long time because we're the largest PRP we'd like everybody's money to run through our account we'll hire the vendor you know have them designate us as the additional insured we'll be the uh, the, the prime contractor of record for this cleanup work but we're going to pay 100 cents on the dollar, and then you're going to reimburse us the 90 cents on the dollar for your share, and then that'll be how we account for the liability. And the auditor will want to understand how those formalities are booked and, and documented and how they're working out. Um, the last thing that an auditor wants to see is anyone look bad, which is from the perspective of, of signing on for 100% of the liability and then not getting everybody else to sign on for that 90 cents on the dollar recovery. That they're again looking for. Situations where uh, one PRP is, is, uh, has a higher standing uh, above all of the other PRPs are in a group. Uh, some questions that have come from some fairly new documents from the Public Companies Accounting Oversight Board, or PCAOB, are instructions straight to auditors. It doesn't mean you're not allowed to read this. It just means that these are instructions from an auditing board to auditors about how to audit. So, and if you want to get uh, uh, some examples of, of instructions to auditors straight from the horse's mouth, I recommend the documents that you see cited on the right-hand side of the, uh, the slide. Is a specialist providing a liability forecast who's qualified? Is the specialist's objectivity impaired? Uh, did the financial statements uh, add up? Is there sufficient evidence to justify a number? Is that evidence reliable? And then if there are any assertions, uh, great. Are there any misstatements? Those types of things that, again, an auditor is, is, is also trying to check for as they're going through individual sites and most commonly looking at the highest dollar reserved sites today. Um, they're looking for the answers to these questions. With that, I just want to underscore the importance of something like a watch list in, in being able to provide answers to questions, even though this document may never leave your hands and may contain privileged information and mean that it never goes to any outsiders. Uh, a watch list is, again, one of those tools for answering an auditor's questions. So I just want to note that you know, it's, it's normal to need and to have and maintain uh, a system of record about where your obligating events are, where your recognition benchmarks are today, and that may be the way that you answer a question, but you may never forward this document on to anyone outside of your immediate work team. There's a separate webinar all together just on estimating environmental liabilities and using a watch list. So I encourage you to follow up in more detail if you're interested. One of the bases of, again, documenting a liability these days is showing progress through the, uh, the obligating event checklist, which is on the left-hand side of the slide, and the recognition benchmarks on the right-hand side of the slide. Nine items on the left, 12 items on the right. The point of this, this list is to give a sense of, of uh, progression over time, that uh, last year there may only have been two obligating events, next year there might be five obligating events, and to show that progress and communicate the progress consistently. So rather than come up with two paragraphs of narrative, it, it, it's far more efficient to say, last year we met uh, uh, obligating event 6.1.3 and 6.1.4. Those weren't in place last year, now they're in place. That's why our reserve went up. Um, so again, keep in mind that this is a standardized list for your use, and it comes from uh, not only general accepted accounting principles, but it was uh, also published in ASTM 3123 uh, two years ago and just updated last year. After liabilities are settled, the reopener list or the post-settlement watch list 
and look just like the pre-recognition watch list, but just have much, much lower probabilities, as I've got outlined in red here in column five, uh, much, much lower probabilities of, uh, of outcomes of, of future obligating events and recognition benchmarks. With that, I just wanted to close with a couple of examples of audit defense metrics that you may find useful for structuring your liability forecasts to, to help uh, an auditor understand where the, the environmental liability management program is going. I'll go over these very briefly uh, with just a couple of highlights and then wrap up our presentation from there. So one example can be summing up a, a site-specific watch list into some portfolio-level metrics where the expected value or weighted average for each individual site, that's uh, split out on the far left side, uh, each individual site is summed up to create an entire portfolio value. The next can be a tracking table of the number of sites. So rather than dollars, you can be tracking new sites coming in, old sites being closed, and the number of sites being managed at the end of a fiscal year. And that can follow with the dollars as well in the bottom half of the slide, where over several years, uh, an auditor can see uh, any stability or, or evolution in the rate at which liabilities are coming in the door, being settled by spending out the door, uh, and any revisions to estimates that are coming in. The aggregate numbers tell a story, that's true, but these components, which are actually standardized and laid out by FASB uh, in this order, B, C, D, and E, uh, communicating environmental liabilities in this fashion can be, again, a useful way of, uh, of, of helping an auditor pinpoint where their concerns or interests are at. Another way of, uh, again, helping an auditor understand a portfolio is to lay out what assumptions are being used to, uh, in, in a sense, make the statement that there's consistency across the portfolio. So part of that can be saying, you know, we have a stable inflation or assumption uh, about discount rates, or if there's some volatility in that, if there's a term, time horizon that's changing or evolving, and if we're using event trees to calculate expected values, instead of using a, a single estimate uh, that may be optimistic, pessimistic, or somewhere in between. And then finally, uh, portfolio electric level metrics can include reserve balances. That's something everybody likes to see uh, it's displayed in row F here. But uh, auditors also find some value in seeing the reasonably possible increment. Again, this is a FASB term of uh, an increment above the current reserve value. And then the remote increment, which has a, a a relevant discount applied to it because it's uh, uh, certainly less likely than the, uh, the current reserve and the reasonably possible increment. Seeing trends over time, again, is one of the useful things because everybody likes to see the same thing. What is that? Over time, the numbers are going down. Whether they're the reserve numbers in row F, the reasonably possible increment in row G, the remote increment in row H, the auditors want to see the same thing, all the numbers are going down year upon year after year after year. Not always possible, but where there's variances, they jump off the page and, and provoke, again, interesting, useful questions to reach some shared understandings, which, again, I think is where everyone's pointing to. So some of the key gap references, if you'd like to dive into detail, are just listed here. Uh, this is a, a fairly stable list these days. Uh, there are minor edits occurring to individual documents, uh, but I just want to point out that as a, as a set of references, this should be good for three to five years before there's a, uh, another new wave of documents. So just to sum up today's uh, webinar, I just want to point out that the targets of interest for an auditor are looking for relevant reports that are faithful representations and that highlight improving and effective capital stewardship. All that works together to build and maintain the trust of stakeholders. The, the professional and enterprise-wide challenges over time are going to be the same things that, that I've expressed in other webinars. Uh, is there a material gap between what's booked today as the current reserve or provision and the fair value if your organization merged with, with another or acquired or was acquired by another? And understanding that there is some gap that's normal, finding out that that's going to be a surprise and that's an unknowable number, that's not a good outcome. Nobody looks good in that. So understanding that there's a material gap and what that is and why is, again, useful. Other challenges are uh, our liabilities settling out at an optimal rate, not too fast, not too slow. The liabilities didn't happen all at once, and they're not going to get settled all at once. But is there an optimal rate that means that, that the liabilities are trending downward uh, reasonably quickly? And then finally, is spending matched by liability settlements? Is your organization getting its money's worth 
from spending out of the reserve. If you're spending $100, do you get dollar for dollar or maybe better of, of a liability reduction uh, off of the reserve? So with that, uh, uh, let me say if you are interested in this topic, feel free to give me a call. I'll have a follow-up survey on this uh, webinar. And again, I'm the technical contact for ASTM 2173, the disclosure standard, and 3123, which is the recognition and derecognition standard. The meter is never running if you call with a, with a short question. I'm happy to answer. Feel free to call anytime. Our YouTube page has something in the order of 27 webinar recordings. And again, you're welcome to listen to those at any time. Thanks for joining us on this.